welcome back, Saddos, to another episode of the Sitcom Archive Deep Dive Overdrive with me, Eggs Benedict. And me, Alison Barton Simmons. No catchphrase. No, I, I, I think I've, I've worn myself out from, from last, last week, I think, with, with my Heidi High. Well, to be fair, that was my last one on my list, so I don't know what I'm going to do next week. <laughs> I need to put the effort in this week. There's only, there's only a finite amount you're happy to repeat, isn't there? Certainly from the 70s and 80s. I have to double check sometimes. I have to Google some things just to make sure that I'm not coming out with something massively racist that oh, was a gotcha. catchphrase in the 70s. When I was a teenager, I picked up on the phrase, oh, do you think I came over on the last banana boat? Okay. And I didn't realise that that was like a, a, a racist statement, a racist remark. So you were wandering around saying this to people and... Yeah. Oh, heck. <laughs> yeah, you live and learn, don't you? You do. Racism, of course, being a hot topic for this week's episode. That was a good segue. It, uh, yes, I was quite proud of that, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even scripted. Because this week's episode of Faulty Towers that we're deep diving is, of course, Series 1, Episode 6, The Germans. The Germans. Which was riddled with controversy after after what happened last year. Um, but before we get stuck into talking about that, remember that you can watch along and listen along with us by watching the episodes on Daily Motion for free via Naughty Links that we share on our social media, or on BritBox and various other places. It's on BBC iPlayer, isn't it? Because It is. Because I, I believe BBC iPlayer is only a catch-up service, not a streaming service. They can only put things on that have recently been on BBC broadcast channels. You can watch live TV on there as well. Right. But So when people are moaning that certain shows aren't on there that are like... Um, Classics. It's because they haven't been broadcast recently, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. You're right. You've, they've got to have been on TV recently, and and, and things go on and come off as and when they're they're, they're on mm. live TV. Yeah. You're right. But because the Faulty Towers has been on TV recently, yes, it's all on there. So fill your boots. It's on there, indeed. It's a controversial episode, or at least it is seen as one in some quarters. Yes. So we're just actually rather than rather than discussing it as as we get to the scenes in question, we're going to just discuss what happened last year, uh, now, and get it out of the way before we get into yeah. the deep dive, so it doesn't distract us. So in in mid twenty twenty last year, the episode was removed from BBC controlled UK TV catch up streaming service. Yep. Citing racial slurs, but interestingly, Netflix and, and BritBox just carried on showing it with with a warning that said contains some racist language and upsetting scenes. Yeah. Upsetting scenes, I'm not really sure, was that relevant? <laughs> um, it, well, it was in, in, in the wake of the George Floyd protests in, in June, wasn't it, last year? Yeah. Um, and I don't... It wasn't, for a, it wasn't for a sort of like a prolonged period of time that it was, it was taken off, but it was, it was like days, I think, that it, it was, was removed. They resta- resta- reinstated it within, within the week. But yeah. you know the way the press like to flame a culture war by blowing things out of proportion. Yeah. And to be fair, John Cleese didn't help. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, it was only off. It was only off the off the air, off the streaming service for a week. Interestingly, most people assumed it was because of the Germans thing, the goose stepping, and all the the you know crowd references. Mm, Initially, people wasn't. didn't realise yeah. that it was to do with the major using racial slurs because he's representative of that old colonial attitudes, you know? Absolutely. Dated attitudes that we, our generation saw in our grandparents. When, when John Cleese was asked about, about this, um, his opinion was that the major, this is what he said, he said, the major was an old fossil left over from decades before. We were not supporting his views, we were making fun of them. If people are, t- are too stupid to see that, what can one say? Yeah. So he was he was sort of holding the, the, the major up who had used racist language to describe people um in India and in the West Indies and he was being held up as a as a as a figure of ridicule almost and John Cleese was of the opinion that if people can't see that we're holding this person up as, as, as a person of ridicule, then what could I say? That's that's their fault, that's their problem. Yeah, and I hundred percent agree with him. Yeah. In that statement, some of the other statements he made around the time were a little bit more inflammatory, maybe. Okay, um, yeah. Because I think it was a good excuse for people on the right to castigate the Black Lives Matter movement as being woke snowflakes, mm. 
Whereas yep. in reality, the the decision was taken by white men in suits to, to take yeah. this off the air. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, actually, the other thing to say about this is back in 2013, they'd already removed that scene from broadcasts yeah. without, without there being a big fuss about it. And Cleese had approved them doing that. It's only because in 2020, with the with the climate, with the George Floyd thing, that yep. it was it became such a huge story. And let's be honest, if it wasn't Faulty Towers, if it was some lesser known sitcom, yeah, then the fuss wouldn't have existed. Do you think that's why people didn't quite realise that the scenes in question weren't the the Germans scenes that were towards the end of the episode, that there were the the the, the majors opinions um the fact that they'd been th- those scenes had been taken out previously do you think that's why people were a bit confused over what the issue actually was possibly um well, people are very quick to draw conclusions without even reading the articles a lot of the time yeah people just see a headline and, and don't even read it and go oh, this is, and this is outrageous yeah mm. the amount of times you see that on social media yeah it's like have you actually read the read the piece yeah there's so much of that going on but of course at the same time this happened, there was also um, blackface in comedy such as Bo Selector, League of Gentlemen, Mighty yeah. Boosh, and uh, Little Britain as well, I think, were also yep. pulled uh-huh. because blackface isn't a very kind way of getting laughs. It's not a um, culturally appropriate thing to do anymore. Yeah. So I guess there's nuance at play between language and physical comedy like that, which is, you know, the act of of blacking up, as they used to call it. Yeah. To me, context is everything, whether they, the minority depicted is the target of the humour. Yeah. Or whether whether it's even necessary to extract humour from the situation. It, it's... I, I just think that people don't apply context in the way that they used to. Yeah. There was um, an example, which is Viggo Mortensen, when he was in a film a couple of years ago, I forget the name of the film, actually. I think he's one of my favourite actors, Viggo Mortensen. Mm. I think he may have won Oscar, well, not Oscars, but awards. He was in a film from the 19... He was set in the 1940s. He was driving a, a piano player around America. Do you know the one I mean? Yes, I do know which one you mean, yeah. can't think of it. Is it Green something? Green Room? It might be. People know what I mean. But um, when he was being interviewed in press junkets and everything, he referred to the commonplace use of the N-word at that time. Okay. And he was, as so, is so often the case, he was pulled over the coals for using the word. But he wasn't using the word as a uh, pejorative term. He was saying people used the word. Okay. So whilst language is important, he is actually just citing that people use the word. God. He's not saying the word in conversation himself. And I think yeah. that's a really crucial difference. And. There is a very strong argument that because language matters, nobody should be saying the word anymore, but that doesn't really fly across all cultures. So it's really difficult. I mean, I think of like some of these South American footballers who come over and have, um, they use the word negrito with, because that was Luis Suarez's famous defence for being openly racist. Yeah. It's a difficult one. And it's difficult as well for people like us who are, most people would say, white and privileged. mm to sit in judgment, I think. Absolutely. Green Book, it was called. Green Book, nice one. What did you say before? Green Room. Green Room. <laughs> that was just the warm up for the interview. Was That's in the green room. That's probably where he the, said it. Before he went on, yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got some other quotes from John Cleese about this ban. Okay. It's not just stupidity. The BBC is now run by a mixture of marketing people and petty bureaucrats. Oh, bureaucrats? Bureaucrats, yep. Yeah. It used to have a large sprinkling of people who'd actually made programmes. Not anymore. So BBC decisions are made by persons whose main concern is not losing their jobs. So he used he used the attention, in my opinion, as a way of getting some of his beefs aired Yeah. with the BBC. Because yeah. he, he is certainly a man with beef. Uh, he also says, I would have hoped someone at the BBC would understand that there are two ways of making fun at human behaviour. One is to attack it directly. The other is to have someone who is patently a figure of fun speak up on behalf of that behaviour, which is, a, I think, a, a very um, eloquent way of putting it. That's exactly yeah. what these scenes were. Of course, the other thing I, I, I wanted to say about this, really, was that in 2061, 40 years from now, mm. anyone who was listen, listening to us on the podcast or any anything from this time will probably pick up on something that's not acceptable. 
then. That's it. As times move on, things just change, don't they? Things move in and out of being acceptable and we we, we learn and just crack on, don't we? Yeah, but I guess the issue is how we handle these historical artefacts of potentially... Yeah. They, they show stereotypes that portray attitudes of the time. Do we yeah. do, do we whitewash them? No pun intended. But do we do we yeah. do we remove them from history, or do we leave them there as a sort of teachable moment and discuss them openly and you know without resorting to labels like snowflakes, which are reductive and yeah. We've had this conversation in 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 my family quite recently. We had this conversation uh, with with family members of all different generations, and it was with regards to the statues. You know, around the same time as um, sure. as this was all taking place last year. And and it was like, well, what what's the right thing to do with with these statues? Because they they are historical artifacts, and do we do we still have them in place to be discussed and talked about? But leaving them in place does that leave them? Are we still celebrating despite the fact of of what's been drawn to mm. the attention now? But that was always there. So what's made it different now? And it it was it was a really interesting conversation to have amongst different ages within within a family and it was hard to sort of have a meeting of minds i suppose not agreeing to disagree but being open to to understanding somebody else's point of view yeah progression doesn't come through censorship ever exactly so, yeah so it's always better to be able to discuss these things and, and have yeah. open and honest conversations and it's uncomfortable it's uncomfortable conversations but i think being open and willing to to discuss these things despite discomfort is what moves things onwards i think i feel the only way forward is to have uncomfortable difficult conversations one final postscript to this in april of this year the bbc actually broadcast the episode of the germans not very Mm -hmm. long ago and it renewed the controversy but ironically the racist scene or rather the major's racist thoughts yeah were were missing so the fuss had moved on to be about the german stereotypes at this point yeah. Oh, they, they broadcast that episode with, without people actually thinking the fuss was actually about the, the major. Yeah, yeah. But now, of course, Basil does call the Germans a crowds. Yeah. So people just love a kerfuffle, I think, is the, is the lesson we can take from this. I had to Google the, the specific scene because obviously when I watched it on the iPlayer, it, the, the, the major scene wasn't in. Right. So I had to Google it to find it. And, um, and it is on there to, to, to watch. I think it was it was it was embedded within something else. It wasn't just on on like YouTube or anything. So I found that quite interesting that I had to watch that as like a standalone scene mm. rather than it being amongst the um, the rest of the scene, the rest of the um, episode. Well, the video that we'll embed onto our notes page for this episode will have the full unabridged version if you wish to see the Germans in its entirety, including the major's racist words. I feel like we should. Have- we shouldn't have to, but you feel like saying like a caveat that it doesn't represent our views. But yeah, I think people, I think people know that. It's obvious it doesn't. Yeah, of course. So, having prefaced the episode with this deconstruction of of, of the uh, fuss from last year and and indeed earlier this year, should we get stuck into talking about the episode proper and do a deep dive of series one, episode six? Let's do that. <laughs> So this is the only episode not to start with the sign, isn't it, famously? Oh, it threw me. It threw me. I kept watching for the um, the sign on the front of the hospital going a bit wonky and, like, letters falling off. Well, that would have been funny. I think they missed a trick there. I'd have thought you'd like that hospital because it oh, was dour and grey in 70s. Oh, it's proper brutalist, that. Yeah. Concrete. <laughs> All my favourite things. <laughs> so Sybil's in hospital with an ingrown toenail. She's having an operation. Basil does seem worried about it to begin with, doesn't he? He's asking if she's got everything that she needs. And is she going to be all right? Yeah. But that doesn't last. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. And it already got my back up that she'd gone into hospital for a few, for a few days for an ingrowing toenail. She, I imagine she really annoyed you, despite not hardly being in the episode. Yeah, um, she she was nagging him from minute one, mentioning the fire drill. Yes. Which, to be honest, why would you have a fire drill when there's only Basil there? Oh, it was already... She was setting him up. I think she was setting him up for failure. Maybe. I mean, she's... She's nagging away at him in this hospital bed, 
um, to fetch her this and do this and do the other, and she wants the moose's head put up, but she's just sat there like a lazy bastard as usual when she could have... There was something on her bed she could have reached for, but she made Basil go and get it. That irritated me. I did make a note about that. Uh, the one, The one job that stuck out to me was that she'd forgotten to scrape the mould off the cheddar this morning and that <laughs> Faulty had to do it when he got back to the hotel. Ugh, yuck. She did, She does have a good line in this opening scene, though, because when they're talking about the moose, Basil says, it'll, it'll lend the lobby a certain ambience. It has a touch of style about it. And she says, yeah. it has a touch of mange about it. <laughs> <laughs> that moose, oh, my goodness. It did look It did look like it was riddled with all it's horrible, things. wasn't it? Yeah, it was. But, but before we get to seeing the moose... A bossy matron type figure bustles in, doesn't she? And yes. Basil's immediately taken against her, and he's he's sort of openly antagonising this woman, isn't he? Because she is a bossy. So she, she she is that stereotype, isn't she? She is, she is, and I, I think Basil um, thinks that he's being spoken to like a dog by the matron because she is quite bossy. Yeah, but uh, as he leaves, he says, "In growing toenail, right foot. You'll find it on the end of the leg." <laughs> sort of leaving on a um, on a put down almost. And then as he goes into the corridor, he bumps into the doctor and he physically recoils. He does. He and does. I don't know what that was about, but I know some people have claimed that that was uh, representative of Basil's uh, racist um, opinions. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. We should mention the doctor, of course, was a sort of African gentleman, wasn't he, with, a, with an accent? Yeah, and he, he shakes his hand. He does shake his hand when he realises that he's, he's Sybil's um, doctor and someone of... A, a, a huge degree of importance mm. in in Sybil's life that day because she's, he's going to be the one that's operating on her. I think though in the sixties and seventies, from what my parents have told me, that positions like doctor and bank manager held so much more um, kudos. Yeah, or gained you so much more kudos with the public. You know, you were oh god, it's a doctor. You know, they were seen yeah. as people to respect far more than they are now. Yeah, which um, I'm not sure is a good or a bad thing, really. You could argue either way. Just as, a, as, an, as an aside to that, the actor that played um, the Doctor, Louis Mahoney, he was a Gambian actor who was an anti-racist activist and he campaigned for racial equality within the acting profession. Oh, good for him. That was quite interesting. I watched a show the other day about Dark as How, not a show, a TV show that dramatised a lot of uh, the Windrush Generation stories. All right, yep. And it was this first one was it was Dark as How and the legal battle that they faced around was it the Mangrove, the the cafe? Yes. Oh I have seen this. Yes, I did see that. I recommend that. I really enjoyed mm. it. BBC thing I think, isn't it? Yes, yes. I recommend something that I can't remember what it's actually called. Never mind, you'll find it if you're interested enough. <laughs> the doctor tells uh, Basil that um, it's going to be quite painful for Sybil. As soon as he's out of sight and earshot, Basil sort of claps his hands together in glee and walks off whistling, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and back at the hotel, he's still full of, sort of joie de vivre. Yeah. He claps at the end of the scene with the Doctor, but then he does the same clap as he's walking into the reception of the hotel. He does, yeah. It's almost like a continuity he just, clap, he's isn't just it? Clapped all the, he's just clapped all the way home. And he's still he's still full of beans, and he's yeah. he's conversing with the major, who's in full sort of dementia mode, isn't he? At this this point, he's asking yeah. over Elsie, who left like two years ago. Evening, major. Evening, forty. Hampshire one. And he he can't remember Sybil's name. He says, "How's?" Uh, um, and then of course he goes on a diatribe about women, which is briefly amusing. He says, "I knew one once," and that leads to his anecdote about the cricket and yeah. Indians and West Indians, which we've already covered. It goes from bad to worse because it's quite a confusing conversation to start off with, with lots of misunderstandings. And then it just goes, yeah, it just goes off on one. There's lots of sort of farce misunderstandings in this yes. conversation as to whether they're talking about Indians or women yeah. or Germans, in fact. Yeah. And ba- Basil says, women have, have minds like Swiss cheese. And the major says, what do you mean, hard? <laughs> he says, no, full of holes. Basil tells the Major at this point about the imminent arrival of the Germans, which in itself leads to a, another sort of vitriolic outburst. He says, bunch of krauts, that's all they are, all of them, bad eggs. Oh, boo the Major. But <laughs> Basil's response to that was quite funny and and quite um, insightful to his own prejudices because he says, well, yes, yeah, forgive and forget, Major. God knows how the bastards... <laughs> <laughs> Because he is the next generation and he can't help retaining some of those 
some of those... The overhanging feelings around the Second World War. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's, he's taking them on, as we all do. We take on the traits of our parents and our parents' generation. Sometimes, I think I said this last week to you, possibly offline, that I'll say something, and I think, where did that come from? Yeah. That's not even my opinion. Yeah, I it's don't It's just something that. you yeah. suddenly heard. You might, I've heard my mother or my father talk through me. So yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true, isn't it? Basil, after this, uh, after this unfortunate scene, <laughs> Basil mm-hmm. goes and retrieves the moose's head from, from the office to work out where to put it on the wall. And what is on the top on the top of the display cabinet directly adjacent, Alison? Did you notice? I didn't. What is it? Pampas grass. I did. No, I did. I am lying. I did notice the pampas grass because I made a mental note to to. to I, I didn't write it down, but there was there was a display of pampas grass in a basket. Do we think at this point that possibly the Germans are coming to a swinging convention? <laughs> Maybe that's what it is, yeah. Yes, it's a swinging convention. <laughs> oh, God, that would just, oh, just throw Basil, wouldn't it? He'd be inside out with, with embarrassment and yeah. misunderstandings. Imagine later on when he comes back with concussion and he walks into the hotel and it's like something from Eyes Wide Shut. Oh my god! But with all the with all the the goings on between him and Manuel the other week, when Manuel went out for his birthday, and then they ended up on the floor, the Germans would have just thought they were just part. You just part of it, obviously. The, yeah. the game, the game. <laughs> Kurt would have been back hoping to get in with Manuel. Oh god! I hope they've got a safe word. And I am from Barcelona. So, do you really think that was a moose's head? Because it looked rather flimsy, like the walls of Faulty Towers. The 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 antler kept flopping. He had a floppy antler. Yeah, but it looked like it was made of plaster of Paris to me. It did. I don't think it was. I think it was It was a, cr- a creation, an artistic creation, not an actual moose head. Not very convincing. No, not at all. Well, Basil's trying to put it on a wall, but unfortunately for him, um, it's sniffed her a clock for the major, isn't it? <laughs> He's yes. ready for his first whiskey. He is. And he says, no, no, no hurry, Faulty, but he clearly wants, wants him to get behind the bar. Yep. Um, and he's, he, he's trying to finish this this stuff with the moose, but then the phone rings. So Basil, having called for Polly and Manuel, who don't come running, he has to... And he gets down off the ladder and puts the moose um, on the reception desk, answers the phone, and of course it's Sybil. I was just doing it, you stupid woman. I just put it down to come here to be reminded by you to do what I'm already doing. I mean, what is the point of reminding me to do what I'm already doing? I mean, what is the bloody point? I'm doing it, aren't I? Nagging him to do the very thing that she's just disrupted him from doing oh see why why is she not just putting her feet up and literally just enjoying the peace and quiet well in the end basil just hangs up on her he says anything else you want the hotel moved a little to the left and then he just just hangs up on her who can blame him manuel turns up late responding to basil's call far too late for basil's liking but basil wants him to get a hammer but of course he doesn't understand and he thinks he's asking him for a ham sandwich yeah so instead he says i'll get the hammer yes you you tidy up, and he sends him behind reception where he starts sort of faffing around, I guess, and he sort of goes down on his hands and knees, sort of out of view. Yes. And as he's down there, he's practising his English, and he's practising his pronunciation and his English accent, and he's saying things like, I speak English very yes. well. And, uh, of course, the major at this point wanders back into the lobby, turns around and sees the moose's head, and assumes, Aww. like a dotty old bastard perhaps would, that... What we've got here is a talking moose head. Of course, because that's the first thing that you would think, that it's a chatting moose head. How are you, sir? (laughs) I can speak English. (laughs) Oh, hello, Major. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. It's a beautiful day today. Is it? Oh, uh, yes, yes, I, I suppose it is. Yes, I can speak English. <laughs> I learned it from a book. Did you? Did you really? I like the stutter from the major, though, in his panic. I, 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 I am very well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, he answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he has a full conversation with the moose. And then um, Polly comes in with the flowers to make reception look nice. And I thought, what's all that about? But it was just a setup for another physical gag, really, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And shortly after that, Sybil f- calls again to make sure Basil's putting the moose up. I mean, what's going through her brain? Yeah. Um, this made me laugh, though, because as soon as he answered the phone, he just says, I'm doing it now! <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he knows it's her. Yeah. And then you get a slapstick scene as the moose head falls on top of Basil immediately after he thinks he's successfully put it on the wall. Yes. And then he trips over Manuel behind reception and the flowers fall on top of him. Oh, and it's just a, it was a whole kerfuffle. Yeah, you needed John Gordon Sinclair in there as well. <laughs> Classic John Gordon Sinclair shtick. And Polly's calmly relating all of this information on what's going on to Sybil on the phone. Oh, and he, she just sort of finish, finishes very deadpan with, well, everything else is fine. Yep. Oh, I won't tell her anything. Hello, faulty today's. The next scene's the next morning. And actually, actually she comes up on the screen, it doesn't it? It helps us. Morning. I yeah. quite like that. It came, it came up in, in little words at the bottom of the screen. Little 70s typeface. Next morning. Yeah. So Basil's still failing at putting this moose head up. And one of the antlers is sort of hanging off now and it just looks awful. But it's it's nearly 12 o'clock and it's time for the scheduled fire alarm that Sybil oh mentioned in the exposition yeah. at the start of the episode. I'm already feeling quite anxious before we talk about this because it just went from bad to worse. It's pretty awful. It was. The ignoramus guests don't seem to have read the notice to Basil's irritation. They don't really know there is a fire alarm, most of them. To compound that, Sybil's still phoning and nagging. And, and Basil discovers she's moved the key to the to the oh, fire alarm. Yeah. And the way the farce plays out, Basil has to go and retrieve something from the safe. I'm not actually sure what. Was that the key? Was the key supposed to be on top of the fire alarm box, but she'd put it elsewhere, and it, I think it was in the safe? But he would have needed a key to get into to get the in safe the... to get the key. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. But... um. The way it pans out, she's also, Sybil, turned on the burglar alarm for the safe. So when he opens the safe, the burglar alarm goes off. Yep. And that results in the guest mistaking it for the pre-planned fire drill. And they start Aww. sort of filing out. Yeah. And, and Basil is, handles this with his usual tact and, and decorum, doesn't he? Saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? And ranting and raving at them. Again, he's hyper-focused on the job in hand. But when hmm. something else takes over, that's when he loses the plot. Because he's not able to focus on the other thing that's going on that shouldn't be going on in his head. Yeah, he's a flapper and he's going to yeah. concentrate one thing at a time. Yeah. In, in in many ways, he reminds me of my own dad who sometimes listens to this podcast, so I'll say no more. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm mine. <laughs> there's loads of misunderstanding that the major think, seems to think there's a burglar in the hotel and one of the guests says, what drill? I didn't hear a drill. Oh, yeah. It you just know? got very chaotic. But Basil's such an unreasonable human being because he he can't understand why they would think it was the fire drill because yeah. the fire drills are semi turn higher than the burglar alarm. Oh jeez! <laughs> he, he even plays out both alarms so that they can sort of spot the difference. But I couldn't tell the difference, yeah. so no wonder. Well, there was a semi turn difference, I think. But <sighs> how are you supposed to know that without exactly. having, ever having heard them? Mm. The guests were almost being deliberately obtuse. I can understand his frustration with them. They seem a bit thick, most of them. Just trying to just misunderstanding on purpose. It culminates in him calling Miss Tibbs an old fool, doesn't I it? I know. Oh dear. But once he's once he's demoed these two ever so slightly different sounding bells, the big laugh moment comes when he turns off the fire bell and there's like a, a perfectly timed microsecond of peace and quiet before the telephone bell <laughs> rings again. Yes. And he just goes berserk, doesn't he? Because it's obviously Sybil. Thank you so much. Perhaps they're upstairs. What's happening now? Now, <laughs> and he says to the he says to the guests, the fire drill will commence in thirty seconds, and then they just stand around. Yeah, and he says, "Well, you're just going to stand there. Is that what you would be doing?" And he gets really annoyed, and he, they're like, they quite reasonably say, "Well, if there's going to be an alarm in the next thirty well, seconds, well, what, why would we go anywhere?" Yeah, just wait for it. He says, "Well, I don't know why we bother. We should let you all burn." <laughs> Honestly, he he really does struggle. He really does struggle when there's um, moments of chaos. It was quite a good cut at that point because the moment he says we we should let you all burn, it cuts to Manuel, who is oh at that moment yep. on fire in the kitchen. <laughs> of course. Due to his inability to cook chips. This was when Andrew Sachs mm. got burnt in real life. Is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Right. Poor bastard. And he had... Oh, it wasn't second degree burns, was it? But the the person at Great Ormond Street, as we discussed in another episode, told him he'd have scars for life. Great Ormond Street? Is that not the children's hospital? <laughs> I mean, why not with Great, Great Ormond Street? I know Street? he's small. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was a special special ward just for little 
Spanish waiters. <laughs> Great Ormond Street. <laughs> it was Harley Street. <laughs> Harley Street. And there's a street involved. <laughs> Johnny Depp turns up as um, as the pirate to cheer him up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, well. Oh. But we, we've covered that. We have. There's lots of to and fro in and out of the kitchen while mm. Faulty's trying to keep the door shut, insisting that there's not a fire, and Manuel's trying to get out because there is, <laughs> there is a fire and he's burning <laughs> yeah. to death. And he, at this point, he's, he's like hysterical. He's, he's blaming God. He's, he's doing anything to, to avoid the fact that there is a fire in the kitchen and this is getting serious. Well, he, he locked poor Manuel in the kitchen. Yeah. When, when he eventually acquiesces and, and unlocks it because one of the guests complains about the noise, Manuel's reaction is to say, oh, Mr. Fotty, you saved me. He saved thought, me. He almost yeah. killed you, you daft bugger. Yes, yeah. But there's a scene in the reception then where um, Faulty is trying to turn the fire, he's trying to start the fire alarm and he throws his typewriter to set the fire alarm off and completely misses. Yeah. But then gets the fire extinguisher and this is where the problems start for for Faulty because he, he doesn't know how to work it. Manuel gets involved and then he squirts himself in the face with, with the fire extinguisher. And the pan that Manuel's got hold of ends up smashing Faulty around the head. Is that why he passed out, was it? Yes. Because okay. he, he, as, he, as he stands up from squirting himself in the face, Manuel's frying pan catches him on the back of the head and that's what results in him being taken into the same hospital in the same room as, as Sybil, by the looks of it. In the ingrowing toenail ward. In the in- <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 70s hospitals, eh? There's one room. I have to take it in turns. It's, just, it's like a quick fit workshop. Do everything <laughs> in one place. And he's got his, his head bandaged. When when we see him in the hospital bed, his head's bandaged ra- really mm. randomly. It is a bit... Yeah, it's, it's done for comedy, I think. It's, yeah. yeah it's a, it looks like a pint of Guinness, doesn't he? <laughs> it's weird. But he, when he wakes up, he does some great eye acting. He does. He does lots of peeping and, and sort of winking and eyes rolling back in his head, yeah. Yeah, all sorts of wink. I don't know why I'm doing it. Nobody can see other than you. I can see it. I appreciate <laughs> the eye, the eyes. And Sybil quite dryly says, well, thank you for coming to see me, Basil. And, oh, blimey. Oh, God, I bet she was well pissed off. Well, the poor bug is drugged up to the eyeballs and he's concussed, isn't he? He's, he doesn't yes. know what's going on. He's ranting and raving about the fire extinguisher and the fire... And he doesn't know where he is. He thinks he's at reception briefly in the hotel. And then, of course, his nemesis, the matron, sister, yes, lady, comes in. And he's like, don't touch me. I don't know where you've been. Yeah, he's so rude to her. And followed by, my God, you're ugly. Horrid. I suppose that's a bit like when you're drunk, though, isn't it? Like people lose their inner monologue and just say things yeah, out loud. Yeah, just say it out loud. Yeah, he's, he's very rude to her. It's interesting, though, that his immediate deference to the doctor comes to the fore when the doctor comes in. He pipes down and behaves himself mm. when the doctor comes in. Again, yeah. due to the status of doctors. Yes. He did what they were told. Yeah, absolutely. But there's this weird sort of thing where he does a fall in a sleep act, which wouldn't fool anyone. No. And the, the, the doctor uses some strange, weird Vulcan death grip. He just wobbles his head yeah. to make him fall asleep, as if as if he was hypnotising him or something. <laughs> Not very convincing, but he's faked it, of course. We see the famous gif of him opening his eye manically. Yes, yeah. When he realises everyone's out of the way, Sybil's left, presumably wheeled out. Yeah, she did. She got, I think the, the, as the doctor wheeled her out, he, he bumped her against all sorts of things trying to get her out of the room. And then we're into the third act, because I very much consider this a three-act episode. It felt like a, like a, like a stage play almost, didn't it? Like mm. it, the, the, the change of, of time. Over the over the episode, back at the hotel, everything seems to be running smoothly without Basil, as you might expect. What a shocker! Polly's conversing competently with the German guests. Yes, and everything seems to be going swimmingly until Basil walks in with the bandage on his head, and he sort of greets Manuel, but then starts calling him dear. 
Because oh, he thinks it's God. Sybil. He says, you go yeah. and have a lie down, dear, to Manuel. He's clearly all over the place at this point. He's bang on the head. He's bang on the head. It really has sort of muddled him up a little bit, hasn't it? More than usual. Well, you can see from a writer's perspective that if they're going to have this guy be- behave in such an appalling way to the Germans, they need to go beyond their usual their usual plot device of having Basil yes. be awkward. Then yes. he, needs to, he needs to have something quite seriously wrong with him to behave if in Something's way. got to have gone wrong in order for him to behave in this way, yeah. 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 And, and, and Manuel knows that something's wrong, so he's like, mm. I go get Polly. Yeah. And he says, I've already had one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I go get Polly. I've already had one. <laughs> He's got his hospital gown underneath his suit still as well. Oh, I didn't notice that, did he? I think I think I, you couldn't see his, his shirt. It looked like the hospital gown, and he just put his suit over the top. Yeah. Oh God. The Germans come to reception, or one set of Germans. Yep. They're, they're speaking in German to him, and he doesn't know what they're saying. And until the wife says, "Do you speak English?" Yeah. And he says, oh, you're German. I'm sorry. I thought there was something wrong with you. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> but they're, they're saying something like, Bier wollen automaten or something. Yeah. Where can I, I hire a car, was, I think? I think it was something to do with the car, yes. But then Basil thinks it's something to do with buying meat. He takes yeah. it very, very literally. Yeah. Like he thinks they're volunteering to go out and get some meat. And he says, we have meat here in the <laughs> building. Oh, it's speaking with a German accent, but loudly. Which is, um, yeah, how some English people cop in a foreign country. Polly shows up, and uh, uh, this is the first point that Basil utters the words, don't mention the war. <laughs> yes. Polly tries to get Basil to have a lie down. And the old ladies tell him they don't think he's very well either, don't they? Mm. He says, well, perhaps not, but I'll live longer than you. Oh, God, he's, just get, he's, he's getting mean and um, muddled and, um, and racist. <laughs> But then the new set of Germans come down, don't they? And he he, he decides to start miming to them about, oh, I can get yeah. you a drink before your meal. And these Germans are fully um, fluent in English. And they sort of say, can we help you? <laughs> He's very happy that they speak English. And he, he says, wonderful, wunderbar. So he, he has to always show them that he's, that he's, that he's got some kind of willingness to, 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 to speak their language and that he perhaps mm. does it a bit more than... They're anticipating. He, he, or that they're he, comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. But then this is where the series of accidental war mentions oh. ensue, isn't it? You get about three in 20 seconds. Yeah. Oh, and some of them are really sort of a stretch. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. The, the first one is, was, I'd like to welcome you all, you war, you all war. Yeah. Bit shoehorned. It, yeah. And he says, would you like a drink before the war? Uh, before dinner. <laughs> and then it's... Uh, he says, I've got shrapnel in the war. Korean! <laughs> so they're coming thick and fast at this point. He seats them down for their meal. He welcomes them and says, it's nice to have some Europeans there. He said, I didn't vote for it myself, quite honestly, but now we're in, I'm determined to make it work. You should have just stopped right there and ended the episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, before Brexit could ruin it, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as he takes their order... He declares the veal is really good. He says, stop talking about the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the and the guest said, well, you started it. To which he replies, no, we didn't. Yes, you did, by invading Poland. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point, the German lady's sobbing. Yeah, she's like face down on the table. I mean, at one point, he's, he's just trotting off a list of Nazis. He's just saying yeah. Goebbels, yes. Goering, yeah. Himmler. The one line here which I thought wasn't as clumsy as the others and, and was really quite well-crafted was, I'll get your hors d'oeuvres. Hors d'oeuvres, which must be made at all times. <laughs> I quite like that one. <laughs> but yeah, most of them were just really crowbarred in. You know, I'm not saying I could have done better. I don't know, some of them... Am I being harsh, saying I, I expect better the Booth and Cleese writing team? It, it, it's quite a short scene. Um, I think before I watched, I was sort of expecting this to this sort of the behaviour of faulty to carry on throughout the episode. But it's quite a short scene, really, isn't it? Mm. He, he has the, the the head accident with the frying pan, and then this is literally a few minutes at the end of the episode. Mm. There's no Germans turn up till the twenty third minute. No, so it's so it is it is right at, pushed to the very end. 
we get the Hitler impression at this stage as well, don't we, with the goose stepping. Well, Polly tries to circumvent that by trying to convince him to do Jimmy Cagney, but it's it's no. And she can see it coming. She can see what's happening. She can see what's what's coming next. Yes, yeah. And the German says, "Go away!" He sort of sings it. <laughs> Go away! Yeah. <laughs> but he, yeah, he does the he does the the whole goose stepping walk. Who's this then? And starts puts his finger across his tash and oh. walks away. He doesn't need to do that because he's got a tash. Yeah. His excuse as well for doing it is that he's trying to cheer this girl up that's crying. Yeah. And he says, I'm trying to cheer her up, you stupid crowd. Probably why it was still controversial when it aired in yeah. April. Because mm. it's a type of language that we don't, you know, isn't acceptable now to be using. I mean, it's there's a very thin line between racism and xenophobia as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But it's sort of, the doctor turns up at this point, doesn't he? And we get sort of Benny Hill style chase ensuing. Yeah, through the through the reception. Yeah, he uses all of the sets in the show. Yes. Apart from the yeah. bar, possibly. And uh, eventually it ends with the moose head falling on top of Basil and knocking him unconscious. Thank God. Yes, and then, and then the Major starts having a conversation with <laughs> Basil the moose. And then the last line, of course, is the Germans stood there saying, however did they win? Yeah. Which, of course, the answer to which is the Americans. There we go. And scene. Very much a three act episode, like I say. Mm. You know, you've got the setup at the beginning, the meltdown over the fire alarm, and then Basil's awful behaviour went concussed. I'm interested to know how this went over in Germany because folklore would have, have it that this episode was one of the most popular of the series when it first aired in Germany in the 90s. Really? But I've got German friends who are of, I don't, I'm going to say off Cleese's age now, they're, they're 60-ish. Yeah. They, they've lived here a long time. And the way they tell it, in Germany, it's the source of a real national shame still. And they do their utmost not to talk about the war or Hitler yeah. or any of those things, which does sound, sound reasonable. So you can't imagine this going over too well to be going on about Himmler and Goering and all of those guys. Absolutely. It, it would it, it would make me feel uncomfortable, especially the 70s wasn't that long after the end of the Second World War. And yeah, there's a definite discomfort, I think. Well, it was nearer to the Second World War then than we are to that episode airing. To that episode, now. yeah. Yeah. So I'd be quite interested if anyone is listening to this from Germany. According to our podcast stats, we have... A couple of German downloads every week. That Yeah, that would be interesting. Get in touch and let us know. When Basil is impersonating Hitler, apparently he shouts the German sentence, Ich kann mit einem Eihoffel flauder lesson toten. Do you know what that translates as? I don't. I don't know what that means. I can kill bats with an egg spoon. Right, okay. Just a load of nonsense that he'd learned. Yep. Apparently he's, he's quite fluent in German, John Cleese. Ah, oh, right. Um, the other interesting little tidbit about this one is that in 2006, John released a song called Don't Mention the World Cup. Oh, God. In in preparation for the 2006 World Cup, which was held in Germany. Yes. The video is on YouTube. It's pretty cringe. Mm. But the I think the sentiment behind it was pretty good because it was effectively a way of encouraging the English and the Australians who had both qualified yeah. Not not to go on about the war when they visited Germany for the World Cup. Oh, okay, right. Because it's, it's a big no-no in Germany, I'm, I've always believed, which is why I yeah. struggled to believe that this episode went down so well. Yeah. Yeah, so German authorities supported the song as a way to dissuade supporters of the England and Australian national football teams from displaying Nazi symbols, which is you can get arrested for. It's a big thing. God. Or gestures during the World Cup. The song was also intended to get England fans to refrain from using rude words towards Germans. Okay. So you'd assume they weren't using sound bites of Basil Fawlty calling anyone a crow. Yeah. At this point. God. Interesting. Did you manage to pick out any bric a brac in this one? I did, and it's not somebody's face this week. Is it's it the moose's weird. head? <laughs> it's not the moose's head. No. <laughs> It was, um, the the item of bric-a-brac that I picked was the Candlewick bedspread right. from the hospital because I, when I think of Candlewick bedspreads, I think of being little and being tucked into um, a, a single bed with the Candlewick bedspread as, as something left over from the 70s. 
which were they were like embroidered raised they had like raised knots of embroidery yeah which like created a pattern on the on the top and they were quite cosy but they were very 60s and 70s kind of um bedroom wear i think mm. yeah would you would you have one of those today were you enamored no, with it no, no not at all no they just make me feel a bit uncomfortable because there's there's a lot of things you talk about fashion wise where you're like I could see that working today, but not this. Yeah, um... not not the candlewick bedspread. No, no. <laughs> what about yourself? Did you pick anything? Uh, I actually fell asleep a bit. When it, well, no, I did pick something. I'll come <laughs> on to it. I didn't fall asleep at all. I did pick something, but I, I forgot to look for things in the hospital, which would have been a nice change of scene. Yes. Yeah. Because you you and I are no stranger to hospitals. Yeah. I suppose it would. It's interesting to see the difference between a hospital. In the seventies, in a hospital today, similar coloured walls. I think. I think they still. They still. Or whether it's just that our hospital, our local hospital here, is just like it's never moved on from the seventies. So it's still got the, that that minty green paint on the walls. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of hospitals are like little sort of time warps, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to make you feel calm. I think those colours, but they actually fill me with mild peril. Hmm. Well, it's yeah. Subjective to your experience, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah. I know um, I was more preoccupied with the different attitude towards the doctor. Yes. When it comes to the hospital. I mean, my, my experience in hospitals in the latter years have been to do with prostate trouble. Yeah. And I find I find that the doctors don't get given the respect that they used to get given at no. all. So The fact that they have to put signs up in hospitals to say, don't abuse the staff. Mm. on like A4 sheets of paper stuck all over the walls like don't don't be an arsehole to, to, the, to, to the staff here it, it, it's quite telling tells its own story doesn't it it does I think when I when, last time I went in I had to have um, my prostate checked straight away and the the, yep. reg, the registrar came to do it it was like a young lad who yeah maybe not long out of medical school and they thought oh yeah. fucking hell's my lucky day I'm gonna gonna have to stick my finger up this big fat man's arsehole yeah <laughs> <laughs> I tried to put him at ease by making a joke of it. So when he went in, I went, oh, that's the ticket. Oh, Ben. He, <laughs> he popped out. It was sort of like a sound as he came oh, out. Like, yes, yes, everything's just fine. <laughs> oh, and then he quit and worked at Asda. Yeah. So did you pick any bric-a-brac? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that was what <laughs> we were doing. Yeah, bric-a-brac. Um, yes, I did. I picked the ashtray. All oh, right. Was it like a glass... Yeah, uh, like a like a blown glass. Exactly. Yeah, you'd always yeah. see ashtrays, wouldn't you, in the seventies and eighties and even nineties? There'd be all sorts of different ashtrays, but you're right. This one was like the blown glass one. Was it um, like a brown one? Was it like a brown? It was just just sort of see through glass color. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't like the the ones you get in pubs, like the green ones with John yes. Smith's written on there. Yeah. But <laughs> you, you don't see them anymore because smoking's not allowed in. In bars anymore so no it struck me off not necessarily off the time because they were around well into the 80s and 90s but yeah mm. definitely not now i saw something the other day when i that, that referenced um when you'd make something some like a kid of our age in primary school doing like pottery or doing something with regards to arts and crafts and you'd you'd, you'd make an ashtray an ashtray yeah. was quite a quite a, a reasonable thing to have to have been asked to to make in primary school to take home. My mum my mum used out the one that I made for for years. I suppose nowadays it'd be the equivalent of getting kids to make a bong, wouldn't it? <laughs> to take home <laughs> to, to the stone of parent. I'm going to make that recommendation to um to my kids' high school. I think. But I mean, what sort of sort of primary school does glass blow in anyway? We didn't make glass ones. It was a pottery oh. one. Oh, sorry. And it was varnished. Yeah, it was varnished and, yeah, it, it ended up in a right state. <laughs> we didn't do glass blowing. Imagine that glass blowing at 10. <laughs> okay, should we have a little trip over to Fashion Corner? Yes, let's do that. There's plenty to say. Well, well it's, it's time, time to take, take a little trip, trip to the place that long ago was hip. hip. It's Fashion Corner. It's Fashion Corner. It's Fashion Corner. Fashion Corner. So there was lots of... Um, uniform, not really worth a mention in Fashion Corner, I don't think. The Doctor had a white coat on and the sister on the ward had like a matron's uniform on, very much of the profession and of the, and of the time. Um, but in the reception, when the, the guests come down for the, the fire drill, which isn't a fire drill initially, but turns out to be the fire drill, there's a lady who 
it's an actress, Claire Davenport, who played... She's not referenced in the scene, but Miss Wilson. I only found this out by looking at the credits at the end. She's the lady that's in reception. She's the, 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 the larger lady. She's got like a grey coat, but ev- all her accessories are bright pink. So she's got bright pink gloves on. She's got bright pink earrings, a scarf, a pocket square. She's also got like a pearl bracelet on as well. And she stood out because the, 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 the accessories against the, the grey coat that she had on were quite striking. And you can't miss her because she's the only one in that scene, really, that's sort of chitter-chattering with, mm, with faulty. Very striking, isn't um, she? She is. She is. Next to her, there's a, a, an uncredited member of the cast. It's a lady and she's wearing lime green flat-fronted trousers and, like, a patterned floral shirt and a collared white belt. No, not collared white belt at all. A white belt around around the trousers. But just that outfit, despite the fact that it did look of that time and you could you could definitely reference that it was of the 70s that is i can i can sort of picture sort of high-end fashion brands having that advertising clothes of of a similar style in in recent years definitely like i want to say um like versace that 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 kind of that kind of look but the the very sort of the, the green was almost like a Kermit green. I, I know that that's not a real colour, but very, very striking, a very, very striking colour. Miss Tibbs and Miss Gatsby come down. They're dressed up, mm. dressed up to the nines for a fire drill. Miss Gatsby, in particular, has this like rust-coloured jacket and and hat with flowers in. It's like you know, like if you if you drew an old lady when you were a kid and you'd, you'd draw like a plant pot hat with flowers coming out of it. She that's that's what she had on um, with beads, sort of. To, to accessorise the outfit, she she looked very, very cool, very sweet. They've always they're always jangling beads around those two though, aren't they? They are. They're very they're always very dressed up. They're always dressed for as if they're going as if they're going out. Even if they're just coming down for dinner, they're always dressed up. You don't think it's representative of anal play that the major's doing with them? I, I'm gonna say no. Okay, fair enough. Just positing <laughs> an idea. That's all. <laughs> one of the German guests, the one that that ends up face down on the table crying. She's in like a full-on peach outfit. It's like a peasant blouse, elasticated around the waist and matching trousers. So she's in like a one colour. But looks, she, she looks very elegant. Very, very, very elegant. And Polly has, she's sort of out of her normal powder blue uniform that she tends to wear um, while she's working. She's in like a sage green cardigan dress. It's got like a tie around the neck. She looks very smart and she's, I don't know whether it's sort of Connie Boo's colouring, but a lot of a lot of greens seem to really suit her. Um, so that yeah, that was it. That's it for the, for for this week's fashion corner. I did think there was a lot of very bright colours on display at that fire drill. Yes, yes, the the, the pinks of of um, she called Miss Wilson. She, that, that was very striking. She looked very striking. You bastard! <laughs> If you're enjoying what we're doing here at Sado, uh, we have a Facebook page that you can find by searching Sado Podcast. And we also have a growing Facebook group that you can join and contribute to with discussions or memes or rarities that you find. Uh, You can also vote for the subject matter of our forthcoming Series 3, which will be out later this year. Subscribe to our newsletter by visiting our website, which is sado.club. And you can get more information about us, read the blog, um, shout us a coffee and listen to episodes if you don't do podcast apps. You can also watch the original episodes that we discuss on our episode notes pages um, or take our good life quiz. Get in touch and email us at saddopodcast at gmail.com and subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks to the um, individual last week who let us know that we uh, misstepped and didn't mention that Ronald, the diner with the wrong shaped chips, was also the young boy that Margot Ledbetter called a horrid child in the um, Sound of Music episode of The Good Life. Oh, thank you for that. That is, yeah, that's a definite, um, that definitely needs a mention. You ghastly child, sorry, not horrid child. Yes. Oh, that's one of my favourites. Only two roles that fella had before he then grew up and became a chef. Oh. It's a very remiss of us. It is, absolutely. So next week is Series 2, Episode 1, which I don't know if you're going to enjoy. Do you know which one it is? I can't remember which one it is. What? Is it... Um, that was a clue. Yeah. Is it something about miscommunication? Mi- uh, communication problems, yeah. Mrs. Richards. There we go. With a malfunctioning hearing aid. Yeah. Oh, what? 
So, so some great lines in it, though. Is this a part of your brain? Yes. Oh. So that's the first episode of Series 2, and we'll discuss that next week. Until then... Me. Who loves you, baby? Holdy ho. <laughs> Don't mention the World Cup. Don't mention the war. That's what the fool is for. They might have bombed our chip shop 60 years ago.